Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us to this exciting panel. Uh, we, have a great, uh, we have a great leaders on stage, and uh, we're uh, excited to share some of our personal and organizational stories uh, this morning. Uh, this panel is very much a reaction to uh, uh, world, in, world events, uh, events here in the US, uh, um, especially before during and after uh, the election here, uh, specifically the discussion around travel ban, the discussion around uh, minorities and uh, women uh, rights, uh, gamers, gay, etc. cetera. Um, and what we wanted to do is to really gather a few uh, leaders in, or in organizations here and worldwide and really uh, speak with them, people who, who uh, put uh, diversity at the high priority level inside the organization and, and personally and, and get their stories. Really share the stories of what drives them and mostly what works and what doesn't work uh, for them um, as they do that. Um, and I'm personally, I'm looking forward to that. We had a few uh, discussion before we went on stage um, and uh, it's going to be very exciting. Uh, the, the stories that I heard um, are, are very interesting. And um, I think, you know, we're, we're going actually to start with something a bit different. Um, all of you here are leaders in your own organizations. Uh, this is Game Beat Summit. So we thought of starting off with a short game, role-playing game today. Um, and um, we want all of you to actually participate. So how about all of you stand up? Everyone, stand up, get you okay. excited. So you can do it with her. Um, do it with you since um, she, you know. We want you to basically cut into two, uh, choose a partner next to you, uh, say hello, <laughs> say hello, say your name. Hello. Uh, Good meeting you, buddy. Nice to meet you. <laughs> really happy. Um, one, one of you will be A and one of you will be B. I want all of each one of you to think. It's always interesting. Awesome. Think of think of something you are very very passionate about. Shh. Hello, everyone. Think of something. We have thirty minutes and we got a lot to cover. So, uh, think of, of an issue or something you are very very passionate about. Um, and we're going to uh, people a, you know. Tell your partner uh, about that. And we want the other person to actually totally ignore or dismiss <laughs> the other person's passionate issue. Or so, crit criticize. Criticize, you know, be, be creative. Be, be, exactly. Uh, um, and we'll take a minute and let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that right now. So tell us your stories. Do you want to start? Uh, you want me to start? Sure. I'm very excited about esports. Okay. Electronic sports. I'm supposed to ignore yeah, yeah. you. Also it's the opposite. A few people you know why? Time. Because it's the first you know time that I'm seeing in games. I mean, there are issues with esports, but it's the first time I'm seeing in games kind of breaking this isolation that people are. Yes. I think you're wrong. <laughs> that people are sitting in their basement How or on is the that, screen. Though? That sounds so non-interactive. It's like they're going out <laughs> physically, oh, being together, celebrating something they're passionate about. It doesn't have to exactly. It creates yeah, yeah. a whole How new culture. How can you be passionate about esports sitting in your basement? That doesn't make any sense. No, no, that's what I'm saying. That they actually move from the basement. I think you're highly mistaken. Well done. Everyone, right. everyone, right. everyone, everyone, <laughs> everyone. Well done. Well done. Right, and just to... Okay. Like you know, everyone. I'm really excited. I'm interested in esports. Also, Everyone, thank you. And just to balance things out, just stand, stand. Just to balance things out, uh, let's do the other way around. B, now you tell A, you're the uh, thing you are passionate about. But A, you go ahead and be supportive. Be positive about it. Support that cause. So let's do that. So I'm very uh, passionate about um, 
wine. Oh, nice. I'm a wine enthusiast. I enjoy Ooh. it. I love it. I get very excited about do, it. Do you purchase a lot of wine? I purchase a lot of wine. We're not I doing actually uh, travel to a lot of yeah. places yeah. and try to collect get the different types of wine. From Being fully present. And how did you learn about it? Alone or did you go to some... No, I haven't learned. Uh, friends and um, visiting different and wineries and visiting different yeah. festivals. Everyone's fully present. And it's something that I'm very passionate about. Perfect. Perfect. More so about... Guys, thank you very, very much. Wine Everyone wine in the wine audience. Wine. Uh, well done. For sure. <laughs> Good job. Great job. Well done. See, so, stop talking. by the way, we can continue that right after uh, the panel. Um, well, I, I hope you got your attention. You got to your uh, creative leadership and communicative skills just up, so, um, and that's good because what we are talking about is, is critical, it's important, but it's also loaded and emotional for a lot of people. We are, we are honored to have both you as leaders and the leaders on stage today to, to talk about it. We definitely want to cover, um, to cover more. And to start off, I'll, I'll start with more of that sort of personal question. Um, um, with with your your own stories, and uh, how about we'll start Astro with you and go back. Maybe you guys can tell us from from a more personal perspective. Um, sure. Um, you know what what did you see and what you know what were the tools and what were your strategies as you were you know facing any type of challenges that's coming out of diversity or or lack of inclusivity in uh, in any organization you've been to through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I mean, personally for me, it has really stemmed and rooted from um, my parents, particularly my father, um, who immigrated here from India and went straight to Oklahoma. And as you can imagine, that was culture shock. Um, but you know, I, um, he is a role model of mine and that's something that has remained with me, I've carried with me. Um, so being South Asian, um, along with that, you know, comes a lot of, a lot of challenges, a lot of constraints, um, even more so when you're female South Asian, you're sort of, you know, expected or you were expected years ago to respect your elders, speak, speak softly, um, don't cause too much of a scene. And those were sort of, that was the environment that I grew up in. And, um, that became my biggest obstacle as I started entering into my career and evolving my career, and I, I grappled with that quite a bit. Um, but I think for me, my personal story, I mean, there are many of them, but just sort of one, one of the, the strongest points is, you know, I saw my father come to this country with nothing, and I'm sure many of you who have um, parents who are immigrants or who are immigrants yourselves, um, it's definitely not a privileged life. It's a life that is filled with a lot of hard work, dedication, drive, and you kind of never quit because you can't. And so those were some of the, the core values that um, have stayed with me, have resonated with me, um, and have become even stronger with the climate today, right? So I'm also, um, not only am I South Asian, but I'm also Muslim. And so along with that, there have been, there's been a lot of uh, chatter around that recently. And so for me personally, that just makes me even more driven. And it's my job, um, not only personally, but more so in my workplace, to remind people that um, this is who I am, female, South Asian, Muslim, right? Um, and that is so diverse, but um, I continue to be a leader that makes me no less of a leader, driven, strong. And I, as long as I know what I'm doing in my space, right. there should be no question about my gender, identity, what I choose to practice. Right. Megan, with, with different backgrounds, how do you, you know, look? Everyone um, has a different story. Right, different and stories. How do things. you overcome? Well, I, oh, I knew from an early age that uh, I had a sense that women in creativity weren't respected, and I'm both of those. Uh, so I avoided corporate uh, culture my whole life and uh, was in films, uh, storytelling, and literally fluked into gaming. Um, I got a job as uh, 
creative director, and um, in 1998, I went from creative director to being the CEO in an instant. Um, it happened at a board meeting, and the CEO resigned, uh, and they looked at me and said, we think you can do it. Uh, the reason he resigned is because, at the time, publishers believed that girls and women were computer phobic, and so therefore there was no market. And uh, I remember thinking, wow, devaluing girls and women to such an extent that they would exclude half the population in an emerging medium, much less one that's all about playing games, is insane. Um, and I had no formal um, uh, financial or management training, but I was raised creatively, so I led that way. And since the system didn't include us, we sidestepped it. Um, we were making a game for girls. And I was advised, if you're going to make a game for girls, make it pink, and they'll come. Uh, we made it unpink. We blended entertainment and education in such a seamless and non-spinachy way that the girls were having so much fun, they didn't even realize they were learning. And that decision, taking that risk, resulted in thousands of testimonials from girls uh, telling us they were so inspired by the games, they went on to become scientists, cryptologists, detectives. Uh, we even had a, a NASA engineer who came back to be our moderator. <laughs> and uh, since they wouldn't let us into retail, we found another way in through Amazon, a startup at the time. And that decision led to a retail publishing deal. Um, and we enjoyed uh, about a decade of inspired employees and customers and award-winning products, increasing revenues. Um, and it wasn't that we didn't have issues or problems, because we did. Uh, but I think it was our tendency towards uh, a focus on creative collaboration that helped us overcome all the obstacles and um, defy the odds. I see you see, in your organization, through your life, you see a lot of different stories. Uh, you work with a lot of different organizations around the world. Um, what do you see as a great strategy to sort of face a lot of these challenges? Yeah, so uh, let's just uh, put the context that that's more my head of Games for Change, right? Games for Social Impact. And it's a community that um, is all around the world. Uh, developers, uh, whether it's independent developers or companies uh, that are trying to convey something with video games that is beyond entertainment. And um, what, uh, what happened is that when I joined the organization and started uh, leading it a few years back, it was very much a top-down community in the sense that the funding, the capital, the sponsors led, um, led the voice. It's still true today that there's a lot of that, but what, what I started to understand, by the way, I didn't understand it on my own. I understood it because I heard a lot of voices coming from the community saying it can't be just that model that you know, a big corporation is coming in and saying, oh, we are interested in climate change, and it's very safe, so we can talk about it, and we want a, a group of uh, indies to make it for us, and then we'll make a big PR stunt, and everybody is going to be happy. So we, we started to put a lot of effort into almost like do the, the upside down model of getting indies to be more interested in making those games out of their own passion. Right. And not only encouraging that, but also bringing their voices to the conversation. And today, you know, five years later, we have indies curating the conference. Right. And, you know, making sure that they're, they're actually directing the conversation. Yeah. Rami, maybe you can also share with us, uh, um, you know, even an anecdotal story about. Yeah. yeah. Well, my, my place in the industry is, is very different. I'm the co founder of a small independent studio of just two people. So the, the main way I interact with, with issues such as uh, leadership and diversity is through my work for the indie scene as a right. sort of a global structure. And I found that one of the, the best ways to make sure that the scene, the industry is diverse is, is decentralizing a lot of this. Uh, because a lot of places have very different needs and very different requirements. So one of the things that I've, I've always looked for is community leaders and, and you know, people that are willing to take 
to, to do work to push those communities. So trying to find those people, identify those people, identify the people that you know, will grow a community in a, in a diverse and positive way and then helping them out achieve that has been a major part of what I do and a major part of, of how I try to deal with these issues. We, we, a lot of time we learn from failures best. So can you share with us, Rami, sort of some time when you tried oh. to actually push or, yeah. or you know, overcome a challenge and it just didn't work on, on, on an organizational well, so level? So one time I was, um, I was visiting South Africa, Johannesburg to be precise, to, um, to help out at a local school there, a game development school where they were teaching students to be game developers. And I was giving a talk and at the, um, the, the woman that had invited me, Hanli, Hanli Geiser, uh, she was watching the talk and at the end there was a Q&A for the students and uh, one of the students being somewhat cheeky uh, asked me uh, whether they should drop out of school, hmm. which is a question I get a lot and uh, I've, I've learned to answer that question in a very um, in sort of a safe way, which is, well, you know, that's a, personal, that's a personal decision. You're the only one who knows the circumstances of your life. Uh, but if you have to ask me, I would generally recommend not to do it, right? This has to be your own choice. And, you know, some people learn better outside of school. So I told, I told the kid that, and then the teacher, Hanley, afterwards grabbed me and said, if you ever do that, you're never coming back to the school again. <laughs> right. And I was shocked because I've, I've always, you know, seen that as the safe. <coughs> it turns out that if a student drops out in Johannesburg, South Africa, the consequences are very different. Right. from the consequences that you would have in the Netherlands. And that was back in 2011. And since then, I've never made that mistake again. I've, I've always tried to see a situation as a, as a whole and understand that circumstances are different. And honestly, the only way to know is to just ask and like get a good understanding of what the situation somewhere is. Astra, you've been a leader in different sizes of organizations. Um, obviously, personal... Uh, you know, drive is, is critical to overcome anything that's in front of you. Um, do you have an anecdotal story to, to share with us? What, what worked, and again, you know, even if it didn't work, actually even better. Well, it eventually worked out. But um, so my, when I was at Rating Rainbow, um, and this was a big, you know, you, you have failures and then, um, well, Megan, I know what story you're thinking about, but I won't share that story today. But, um, That's for the or I might, I might. Um, so, actually, I will share that story. Okay. Here we go. It's a good um, story. It's a good story. Uh, I was with, you know, I became the CEO of Reading Rainbow, and along with that, um, I also became LeVar Burton's business partner. And um, I remember walking with him, and I want to say it was, um, I want to say it was E3, and a game conference. And somebody came up to him, looked at me, and looked at LeVar and said, um, you know, oh, can I, can I schedule an appointment with your admin here? And he pointed to me. And <laughs> LeVar looks at me, and I kept quiet. And that was a mistake, because mm -hmm. I should have said something. And I didn't. Um, LeVar looked at me and he looked at him and he said, well, she's my fucking CEO, you know, and, and that was pretty awesome. So, um, <laughs> that's support. I'm, I am yeah. there and, you know, I think it does go back to that and we'll get to that later in the panel, but it is about finding a sponsor, finding the support. Um, you know, my, my, what, what my personal, I, I don't want to say failure, but it's something that I've learned from is have a voice at the table wherever you're at. I didn't have that voice at times where I should have, um, particularly in fundraising. For example, I remember going to a VC saying, here's our big idea. And he's like, well, not interested. And I said, OK. Mm -hmm. I walked away. You know. So <clears throat> just over time, learning um, through obviously the process, you learn to have a voice at the table, represent yourself. Yeah. It's, uh, Megan, you've, you've uh, been. I've thrown been, into yeah. a situation <laughs> of being a CEO, being a leader, but since then you've been leaders in different organizations. Um, how do you put the emphasis on diversity? You know, if you do that, what, what, did you, what do you find as, as good strategies to do that? Or is it coming organically into, uh, into what you do and into the organization? Oh, good. I don't have to talk about my failure. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, we... Literally, um, I think because I was an unconventional CEO and I didn't have the, the usual credentials, 
uh, it worked to our advantage because um, uh, no one had to know everything, and there was this, we co-created the, um, uh, the culture, really. Uh, we kept overcoming obstacles because no one was for us, right? So right. we were like little underdogs uh, playing our way into success. And so after um, a couple things we completely overcame that seemed insurmountable, I would email someone and say, wow, look at what we did. I think it's because we did this. What do you think? And then they'd answer me back, and I you know, kept doing that to employees. And that became fodder for our culture values. So that became the document of respect and collaboration because everyone was actually embodying it. We didn't, in, you know, impart it on everyone. And um, you know, those, no, the politics. You know, we were totally against that. You know, if you have an issue with someone, you use courage to go and address it, coming from curiosity. Uh, to try to understand, because usually it's not even the it's not even what you thought it was, but it gets in the way of productivity. It gets in the way of making meaning right. and money, right? And that was driven by you and the rest of the management. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, we kind of we yeah. as a as a gang as a group operated organically. That way. So organically, like. and I I was. Um, in film, and creative collaboration is the only way you can create something extraordinary. Yeah. You have to, you have to be listening for the best idea. It's not, and that can come from anywhere. Right. I see. You see a lot of different organization: developers, publishers, service providers around the world. Do you feel that there are certain tactics or certain ways that uh, leaders in those different organizations are implementing? You know, diversity culturally, gender-wise, other um, in in the, those organizations around the world. Yes. So one thing maybe to mention is that I feel that uh, diversity. You know, we're, we're using a lot of slogans, and we need to. Right. But at the end of the day, it's a very complex and and has many many layers, right? Right. So you know, for example, when we have the event and we represent all those organizations that you talk about. It's very easy to fall into the formula of, OK, how many women we have among the speakers? You know, a diversity on a panel. But it's so much deeper than that. And, and some of the marginal issues are not even on the radar. You need to really look hard for them. So I'll give you an example, actually, that we did with Rami together. Um, we spoke with Rami. Uh, I think I met him in, in a conference like this. And he told me how many developers he's meeting around the world that are not English speakers. And for that reason, they don't get um, the same opportunities that right. English speaking developers. So we did, we curated some of those games. Rami led that project. We put it at Games for Change. We had games in Arabic and Farsi and. Um, yeah, around the world, Spanish, uh, Portuguese. Yeah, and, and uh, games that otherwise you wouldn't even necessarily get to in the West. Right. Uh, so this is an example for something kind of unexpected different that you just it, you need to walk very deep to get to. That's uh, so so a lot of what I hear and a lot of what we talked about is is really top down management or leadership decision to have to have um, priorities around inclusivity around diversity. Some of the panels yesterday and earlier today were talking about the same thing. Um, um, Rami, when when you are going around, you see you see a lot of indies, but you are speaking to a lot of bigger organizations, do you see, how, do you, how would you describe those type of leaders uh, that well, I think, put attention to that? I think uh, a lot of good leaders doing good work in this space recognize that no matter you know, what lacks of privileges they might have, that they are still extremely privileged to be in that situation, to, for example, speak English or to live in a country that has you know, a good economy, um, that has access to you know, all sorts of structures that will help them, that will guide them through life, and that they look for people in, with intent and without the short-term focus of profit, but the long-term, you know, health of the culture of the organization. Right. People that do good work in the diversity space tend to understand that in the long term, having diverse perspectives, having different types of people <coughs> will make their organization stronger and will make it uh, more capable to deal with whatever challenge may come in the future. So I think a lot of um, leaders doing good work in this space are looking for opportunities to find diverse people. They are looking at 
the discussions that aren't being had as right. much as the discussions that are being had. They look for opportunities such as non-English speakers, people with uh, physical disabilities, um, and all sorts of, of categories of people whose voice just isn't heard. They put those front and center and listen to them because who knows what kind of um, what kinds of opportunities there may be for that group of people or through that group of people. Do you, do you see the panel in general, do you see certain characteristics that are found in those type of leaders who put, like yourselves, who put uh, tension into those values? They tend to be very diverse. <laughs> uh, honestly, like they, they, can be any, they can be anybody. All that matters is that they have the long-term health of their culture of their organization at heart and that they understand that giving opportunities to those that are marginalized, that are minorities, is good in every possible way, both for, both for those minorities, for those people, but also for their organization. And it's very much a win-win. And recognizing that instead of taking the easy way out of this is fast and easy. You know, people right. that look for those, look for fast and easy, they're not gonna be the leaders that do this. And Astra, do you find that in bigger organization to work as well, or only is it only, you know, the smaller organization? That no, I think it's, it really depends on your leadership. Right. You know, whether it's a big or small organization, um, I can say, you know, for sure at Disney, um, very supportive, um, they're sponsored, you know, we're sponsored um, by whether it's leadership, executives, peers, um, to always make sure diversity and inclusion. So I think to Asi, you had you had said something. Um, you know, we're not we're not just a number to right. meet a quota right. in your company, right? Um, I think there there's a saying that <clears throat> I heard somewhere that really resonated with me, which was, um, you know, you you can be invited to a party. So diversity means that you're invited to a party. Um, Inclusion means that you're being asked to dance at the party, which means that you know we as leaders are asking you to participate, we're empowering you, um, we're asking you to lead, um, bring your ideas to the table. And then I have sort of another layer on top of that that I always like to share. Like imagine going to a party and all you've got is like this really boring um, sort of ballroom dance kind of music going on and now we're adding like reggae and punk and jazz and funk and like imagine just from a creative standpoint how much more lively that party becomes, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the blend when you think about a company or an, or or an organization, you know, diversity Sure, you can add it, but until you actually like use it in, to your advantage within the company, it really is meaningless. And I think <laughs> to add to that, I think uh, the leaders, all leaders need to be diverse thinkers, non-linear and linear, to be able to be leading with curiosity and an open mind and an open heart. Um, you know, I think we're seeing the shift in many companies uh, leading from the heart, supported by the head, uh, because, you know, look at the world right now. We, uh, you know, companies are no longer um, need to be built to last. They need to be built to change. And that means that every leader in the organization, from the top down, the bottom out, bottom up, um, you know, the investment in leadership enhancement uh, is really important because we're changing uh, everything and creativity is the most important <laughs> skill in the 21st century and the most valuable leadership skill we can employ so we all need to learn how to enhance those skills to genuinely welcome diverse people. I want, I want just to add to that that it's also you talked about curiosity it's also about optimism I mean, yes. I think that especially in a time like this, it's very easy to kind of, you know, put, look down, say, okay, let's just wait until it's over, you know, focus on other things. But uh, that's the time for the leaders that really believe in the ability to do change and um, look at this op in an optimistic way, look long term, and even understand that this is the time actually to make the biggest changes and not, you know. I'm a true time. believer in physics. In, <laughs> I'm a true believer in physics. Um, so I think that every force has counter force. Yep. Saturday Night Live hasn't been so, so funny in, in a few years now. So that's just a start. I think it all comes from leadership. I think a lot of more leaders are taking action and, and actually acting on this. 
Um, Megan, the rest of the panel, um, has asked um, um, other leaders in the industry to actually give their thoughts, their tips uh, about inclusivity. And we actually gathered a lot of it. We, we have this printed out. If we'll have later on, we'll, we'll put the link online. Uh, so we'll see an evolving document that can help each and every one of the leaders here in the room and outside of the room to actually act upon diversity, inclusivity in their own, own organization. I want to thank you, the panel, very much, each and every one of you, and uh, GamesBeat and VentureBeat for hosting this important issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.